Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us at this busy time. Um, my name is Jonathan Hardy. I'm vice chair of MEXA's Policy Network. And today is the third and final event in a series of seminars organised by MEXA Policy Network. So if you're unfamiliar with that, we're a grouping of academics and researchers interested in media and communications policy located within the subject association for media studies, MEXA. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Nessa Kedo, for a number of reasons. Um, Nessa is senior lecturer in the Media School at London College of Communications, part of the University of the Arts London. And I joined LCC myself last year. So I've had the pleasure of working with Nessa as a colleague, um, including on an event we organised last month, Amplifying Black Voices in Creative Media and Marketing. Nessa is joint author with Clive and Wonka of a book, Managing Diversity in the Cultural and Creative Industries, coming out soon this year, I think, uh, from Routledge. And beyond academia, Nessa is also the founder of Munch Free, a free from vegan and organic baby toddler food brand that was recently recognised in Tech Round's 50 Under 50 um, BAME Entrepreneurs of 2020. The other key reasons um, I'm delighted to welcome Nessa because of the topic of Nessa's talk today, meritocracy and diversity politics in professional advertising organisations. It's really important that the policy network engages with policy issues right across communications, something that the officers and members have been very keen to see. So I'm delighted we're representing that today. Secondly, Marketing communications and the many industrial, social and cultural issues that surround it is still displaced within the organisation of the field of communication studies. And we might, I hope, discuss that, those of you who come today because you're interested in this topic um, together, perhaps before we finish. There's no grouping for marketing communications in Mexa. In Acrea, the advertising temporary working group has now ceased. There's no identifiable group in IAMCR and the groupings within the um, International Communication Association don't quite fit, certainly the totality of Nessa's work and topic today. The final reason I'm delighted to welcome Nessa is because her research is really of huge importance in helping to identify and assess how adequately the marketing communications industries have responded to demands for deep reform, to tackle structural racism, discrimination and inequality in order to reshape communications messages, how they're produced and how all of those involved are treated. So I'm delighted to welcome Nessa, over to you. Thanks so much, Jonathan, for that introduction and also to Phil for inviting me along. Um, so I'm, and good afternoon, everyone, as well. Uh, so thank you again for joining. And today I'm going to present part of my research that I've been working on for quite a few years since I completed my PhD. Um, and I've always kind of had an interest in diversity and advertising. Started out my career kind of about 10 years ago in advertising um, and faced lots of the issues that kind of ethnic minority practitioners are facing today. Um, and my PhD kind of looked at the ways that advertising practitioners were reproducing cultural messages, the way that racism is quite easily embedded within um, final products of advertising. So I looked a lot at, on cultural production, um, the misrepresentation of race and how racism is brought into fruition as well throughout the industry. Um, so this particular paper is kind of a development of that. And my more recent research looks at professional advertising organisations. So I've gone from moving from investigating practitioners themselves, either kind of freelancers in the gig economy, working as consultants, um, to those who are actually working within kind of large global advertising organisations, um, and more smaller SME localised ones as well. Um, but actually professional advertising organisations are important to look at because they're the ones who set a lot of the agendas in terms of what is good practice across the industry and have a lot of these um, 
practitioners, whether they're freelance or working as practitioners within organisations who are part of their membership. Um, so it's kind of like within this wider structure, um, professional advertising organisations, and I'll use some examples in a moment um, to contextualise, are the ones who are kind of setting these diversity agendas, setting what is good practice. And I'm really going to be looking at how a lot of the time there is lots of meritocracy that takes place in different ways throughout the industry. Um, so I'm going to do a brief overview of why professional advertising organisations um, are introduced by kind of contextualising racist advertising um, and how it's been brought in for, into fruition and out of fruition, supposedly, over the past um, century. Um, looking at what diversity agendas actually are and how they are meritocratic in lots of instances. Speak a bit about the methodological approaches and a bit of an insight into some of the findings. Um, there's lots of findings to go through, so um, I'll only be selecting some of them that are most relevant. Uh, so if, if anyone's been along to any of my talks before, I usually like to start off with this image, um, mostly because when I speak to practitioners who um, are in denial about racism and kind of microaggressions across the industry, they often say, well, racist advertising doesn't exist anymore. And they kind of refer to images such as this from Pierce Soap, um, still a brand operating mostly in Europe today, um, where in this was probably around 1890, this advertisement was produced. Um, of course, on the left hand side, you've got a white child who's bathing a black child. Um, of course, then uses pear soap and suddenly his body becomes white. Um, and it's kind of all of um, Anne McClintock did lots of research in this kind of around early 2000s where um, <laughs> there's kind of like this purity around whiteness, um, particularly around the beauty industry, which we still see lots of today as well. Um, and kind of moving into 2017 and this Dove advert, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, received huge backlash. Um, there were kind of panels of starting off as a black woman, taking off your top and you become a white woman. Um, and Dove's response to this was that it was taken out of context. Um, and also the kind of black model who was involved in this advert said she wasn't aware that the advert would be edited in this way and again it's taken out of context so it's looking at this relationship between what is actually intentionally racist and how do we determine if an organization or a practitioner has intended for it, for it to be racist and when should it be withdrawn by an organization such as the advertising standards authority so kind of moving into what a professional advertising organisation is and um, looking at the actual policy side of things, there's often lots of confusion around what policy and regulation looks like within the advertising industry. Um, so we have organisations such as the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising, um, which is more so a self-regulated organisation <coughs> within the UK. Um, have a large membership of kind of independents and also agency memberships and um, they facilitate lots of workshops, lots of resources. Um, they've also done lots of work in kind of race and diversity in the past as well. Um, and kind of moving into more of the space around regulation and policy, that's where you look at the Advertising Standards Authority um, and Clearcast. So in order to, for example, broadcast an advert on television, it needs to go through Clearcast first. So Advertising Standards Authority have the CAP and the BCAP codes, which you need to um, abide to. So just as an example with the Dove advert, um, there were lots of complaints in relation to one of ASA's um, regulations in relation to racial offence. So that does, there was lots of arguments around, does this officially fall under the banner of an advert which can be deemed as racially offensive? Or as Dove themselves said, is it just taken out of context? Um, and kind of one of my key arguments, and that's actually um, funny, coincidentally, there was an event by the ASA um, just before this event, actually, which was all about how they're changing their approach or whether they should change their approach to race and racism and diversity within the advertising industry. And they themselves have showed different examples from the past five years or so of adverts which have been banned and withdrawn for being quite blatantly racist um, and others that haven't because they don't directly have a racist message in them, as they would say with the Dove advert. There's, there's not someone kind of going 
going up to the black women and offensively say, saying something that's quite blatantly offensive. So kind of my main argument is that a lot of these professional advertising organisations are actually non-protective spaces. So they are about policy. They are about um, regulation. They're about good practice. But actually, in terms of protecting their workforce and protecting the consumers and the audiences who are actually viewing um, the final adverts, they are not within a protective space. Um, and actually, that's a lot of what those conversations this afternoon um, were discussing. So thinking from a theoretical perspective um, in relation to what the role of professional advertising um, organisations should be and advertising kind of as a wider um, industry that has an impact on consumers and society, and society in general. Um, part of my research looks at how we should situate race and diversity within fields of capital and um, kind of cultural production. So starting off with field theory, where we're looking at different spaces within the media industry. So as we know, the media industry is becoming um, a lot smaller in terms of we're not seeing necessarily advertising agencies and PR agencies. We're seeing larger media organisations um, within these spaces. So we're looking at how now different resources, how gender, how race, how different identifiers of identity um, and diversity are being distributed across um, this wider space or this wider field um, of the media industry. Um, but also we're looking at the practitioners and the workers themselves within these agencies and within these professional advertising organisations. We're looking at their habitus. We're looking at how they're facilitating their symbolic capital. We're looking at the relationship between agency and structure. To what extent, if we're seeing ethnic minority practitioners within either advertising agencies or within wider um, professional advertising organisations, what role do they actually have to um, kind of challenge lots of these systems? Um, lots of my previous research also looks at intentionality, working practice and that relationship with lived experience. And again, linking back to some of those policies um, that the Advertising Standards Authority um, don't currently address in terms of an advertising being com kind of blatantly um, racist. What is then should the role of other organisations such as the IPA, the um, Institute of Practitioners of Advertising, what role should they have in facilitating lots of these relationships? Um, and I'll use some examples of kind of anti-racism agendas and um, unconscious bias training as well to see how this has come into fruition across the industry. And kind of one of the more recent researchers in this field is Darren Wallace, who um, kind of does some research in the UK and the US and wrote this article in relation to the education system in 2019. Um, and he kind of builds this relationship between race and capital. So kind of building on um, lots of Bourgeois' earlier work, lots of Hesmental, lots of Lee Edwards' earlier work um, on how black people and ethnic minorities um, experience racial capital, um, particularly amongst the middle classes in different areas of the UK and also the US. So in particular, he's interested in how um, black cultural cap um, capital is used to contest white hegemony within these spaces. And actually, if we were going to use some of um, some of Wallace's work in the context of the media industry and look at how some of these practitioners have attempted to um, kind of challenge these kind of dominant white ideas that we've seen across the industry over the past decade. Um, I'll, I'll use some examples of how that could actually be used to understand lived experience, working experience and actually the final culture production of advertisements. Um, so I won't go into this in too much detail, but part of what um, what it speaks about is in relation to how Bourdieu's work, early work on field theory, um, how he looks at the field of culture production in relation to the field of power. Um, so in relation to we've got our small advertising agencies in kind of small scale, we've got large organisations, we've got um, within a large scale, we've got um, professional advertising organisations in the field of power. And so this is what I'm mostly interested in within this wider field of power for these organisations who are actually setting regulations, setting standards for good practice. 
what is that relationship between having that kind of um, economic capital and having that cultural capital and to what extent do ethnic minority practitioners um, have a voice um, within these different spaces. And particularly in the in the last year or so, um, there's kind of been not only in advertising or media, there has been lots of talk around diversity policy and diversity agendas and what that should actually look like within these particular industries. To what extent should anti-racism policies be brought into these industries? Um, so we're seeing lots more um, increases in ethnic minority participation participation across the culture and creative industries. There's lots more graduate schemes. There's lots more um, programs within actual agencies outside of university spaces, which is positive. We're also seeing an increase in anti-racism policies, which a year ago did not exist um, within these particular fields. There were kind of wider diversity policies, but in terms of anti-racism um, from lots of the interviews that I did um, prior to a year ago, it, the term would have kind of been non-existent to lots of um, the owners and the leaders of these organisations. Um, and some organisations have increased and introduced their diversity quotas. So for, they've got kind of either a one year plan or a five year plan to increase the amount of ethnic minorities who work in their workspace. And when you look at their policies, um, they believe that this is going to help them with issues around representation. And just one of the <clears throat> a couple of studies that were quite um, relevant to some of these points is Angela McRobbie's study and um, Taylor and David Bryan's study from 2007, where they look at the way that respondents across the cultural um, and creative industry, so younger practitioners working within these spaces, are supposedly less likely to hold critical or socially transformative attitudes um, in relation to diversity issues and for some of those reasons it can be that they're worried that they don't want to kind of cause too much problems within their organizations um, some of the work that Carbado and Gulati speak about is in relation to the relationship to um, grit and grease within an organization so how much tension are you causing um, if you're going to raise an issue that hasn't been spoken about before, such as kind of racism within your organisation. So supposedly young, younger practitioners who are most likely to be ethnic minority within um, the media organisations don't have such transformative views um, or outspoken views, which is partly problematic. And you know, thinking about ideas around meritocracy, um, and again, I've, I've used this image here, just because it's a less familiar image that's been shared um, kind of wider in the media, I should say, um, and on social media, it hasn't really gone viral. But this advert actually came before um, Dove's previous advert. And it, this is something that was shown in both their US and their European campaigns of showing on the left hand side um, kind of a black possibly a mixed race woman on the left hand side um, who slowly transforms into possibly an Asian or Latina lady and after using dust products turns into a white lady. Um, so again it's kind of showing this journey of how how brands see um, particularly the beauty industry, um, ethnic minorities, black women in particular um, as needing to use their products in order to become beautiful. Um, and when we're looking at these different advertising campaigns, it's um, and you're speaking to practitioners within these organisations and professional advertising organisations, they don't have the same view as their ethnic minority colleagues, which is one of the main issues that I'm going to address throughout as well. So meritocracy looks at how practitioners are rewarded or mobilized throughout the industry um, and supposedly people being rewarded based off of talent and hard work um, not necessarily wealth or social status um, so diversity agendas were supposed to meet these in terms of um, proving that you don't have to kind of be from a wealthy background you do well you you get higher in the industry your thoughts are heard um, because you're good at them. So I'll be showing some um, insights from my interviews in relation to this. 
Um, and again, in Taylor and O'Brien's study in 2007, they spoke about those who were within these higher positions in the creative industries and in, in this case, the advertising industry, um, who are usually still white men, believe that the industry is um, meritocratic. Um, and it's shown otherwise. And actually, of course, it is a struggle, particularly for disadvantaged groups. And so it's looking at how is success defined? How are they? How are they defining success? And in a lot of cases, they are defining success as if you get into our agency, if you get into an IPA's training scheme or a graduate scheme, that is an idea of success. We will promote you on LinkedIn. We will talk about you on Twitter um, and it's not really recognised in relation to you being in a senior position and having the actual decisions um, of the final output of the advertisements themselves. And of course, it doesn't address the other barriers to entry. Um, for instance, those who are unable to take um, degrees or masters due to financial issues. Uh, so one of the main research questions within this wider study was, does more diversity equate to better communication and particularly at a senior management level? And part of this research was taken from um, an event by a professional advertising organisation in the UK in 2007. And part of this research looks at a workshop that they put on in relation to how do we improve diversity? Um, so it's, it's kind of looking at what happened, what was happening pre-2020, pre-George Floyd, how were agencies, how were practitioners talking about diversity and race? And since then, how are they speaking about race? How are they, what impact is anti-racism um, agendas and policies having? Um, so, and a lot of my interviews are actually the same. So same interviewees who may be in different agencies, may be in different positions as well. So just to get that consistency in relation to experience and lived experience. Um, so semi-structured interviews with these practitioners took place who are actually members of a professional advertising organisation. Um, so the earlier studies were from 2015 to 17 and the most recent were from late 2020. Um, and kind of one of the main outputs um, in terms of findings was more could be done in relation to better representation in key decision making roles, such as creative directors, those who are actually in charge with planning and strategy, those who are liaising with clients. I think um, a lot of times it's forgotten that advertising PR is unique because you are working with clients. You may want to implement a particular strategy but how do you change the mind of those clients and sometimes that comes through research and analytics as well um so firstly um some some of the findings again i i won't run through all of these for the purpose of time but just to give you an indication um of some of the outputs and developments over the past few years in relation to attitudes um, across these organisations. Um, and this is kind of an, an early statistic, so probably from around 2015, um, 2016, some of my research with smaller SMEs who were particularly focusing on ethnic diversity within their organisations. So this particular man who's um, head of one of these agencies who's um, from South Asian backgrounds says, when we talk about good practice, we need to make sure that we are talking to our audiences making sure that we listen to what is important and how do we do that. Um, when we communicate with a black audience, we could potentially turn on BET, black entertainment television. They want to see themselves in these advertisements. And not only that, they want to see positive images of themselves with families and being happy, playing sports in the park, things like that. Um, and kind of part of this interview that we did, um, which was conducted, conduct, this particular interview was conducted within his agency um, prior to one of the diversity training workshops that he did for one of the professional advertising organisations. We got to speaking about the importance of lived experience um, and the impact that that has on our experiences in the workplace and cultural production. Um, and he turned to me and said, unfortunately for you, um, well, for the Africans, it's different. But if you had, if only the Caribbeans had their own language, I mean, your religion's Christian, you speak English. The only other thing is colour. I mean, if you had your own language, that's the only thing that keeps the glue that binds you together. 
Um, he goes on to say South Asians are the diamond of diversity communications. Londoners now speak 300 different languages and you are not part of that. So, again, it's kind of looking at the way that he speaks about um, excluding particular cultural groups and how he sees, um, again, whether this is going under the guise of racism, unconscious bias, um, for him, language is hugely important. And when you look at lots of the outputs from his agency in relation to what diversity looks like, a lot of it is language using subtitles um, kind of exaggerated representations of UK South Asian audiences. And um, so I kind of went back to interview um, this particular person within his agency. So all of the people have been anonymized um, as well within this study. Um, and we kind of spoke about the developments of diversity. So it's been quite a while since he's spoken and he's still the head of this agency. He still has quite a senior role within um, a diversity position within the professional advertising organization that he represents. Um, and as part of their policy update in 2020, in November 2020, um, he says, we believe in inclusivity and strive to ensure that all ethnic minorities have a voice in society and are equally represented, something we have supported over the past 20 years. And although there hasn't been a shift in the way, I also do some kind of content um, content analyses of the adverts that his agency produces. And whilst there aren't shifts in the way that they actually create advertisements, the types of messages that they, that they do, actually their policy has changed a lot. And a lot of the discourse that they're using um, in public spaces, particularly on Twitter, has substantially changed since the events that took place last year. Um, and I relate this back to some of Patricia Banks's work um, and Patricia Banks looks at the relationship between marketing communications, um, consumption, consumerism and racism um, in different organisation formats such as advertising agencies, um, journalism. And she speaks about the rise of racialized political consumerism. So the way that the events such as last year had an impact on the way that and the attitude that practitioners and the industry had towards social activism and really taking seriously lots of the issues that ethnic minority um, groups have faced um, and how they've actually been kind of used. Um, I'll use the example of kind of the black squares um, within this space of actually trying to um, consumerize um, important political messages. Um, and related to some of these uh, kind of damaging um, perspectives and ideas, which um, Saeed speaks about, um, a professional advertising workshop which took place in 2017 in which he was present at but didn't present in um, evidence is how meritocracy happens um, on a platform and actually um, attempts to kind of disseminate amongst younger ethnic minority practitioners and um, so this particular event was designed for those younger practitioners um, who are ethnic minority graduates starting out in advertising um, and they were kind of encouraging um, 50 or 50 um, young graduates in the room and they were encouraging them to apply to this graduate scheme. And um, so the head of strategy at a UK advertising agency says, if you do well, um, do well and you'll do well. As in, if you do well with an agency, then you'll do well, you'll, you'll progress. There's no reason why you won't progress. And there was kind of lots of this talk about um, how how diff different ways in which you can mobilize throughout the industry, starting out at assistant level, going to director level, and then going to high management levels, if you do well, um, and kind of follow the structure of mobilizing through the industry. Um, similarly, um, a head of diversity and inclusion of a global media agency um, was speaking at this event, and she said, remember, what you think isn't always right. Look back at the best award winning ads over the past decade. They're powerful. Follow what works, but insert your personal touch. Trust me, I'm an expert. So a lot of this talk was around um, kind of what is professionalization in the industry? What is good? What has won awards? What is seen as good practice? Um, and it was less about actually um, being transformative in terms of attitudes and changes. And I guess this is part of what Taylor and Abreen were speaking about in terms of those le those practitioners who are and younger um, and can lower down the tier in terms of positions where um, 
quite scared actually to kind of come forward and say what they actually think and have these types of transformative views. Um, and McQuant in 1993 um, makes reference to these pro processes of professionalisation where the main function of in this case, senior management is to replace, um, reproduce, sorry, a particular structure. So rather than having these transformative attitudes, it's all about this is what wins awards. This is what does well. We don't want to focus too much on particular diverse groups, um, namely the management of their internal divisions. And so thinking about how things have developed, I'm just going to kind of close by looking at a few different events before speaking about um, anti-racism policies. So from 2019, we've kind of seen how things have developed since 2017. Um, we've seen lots of blatantly racist um, and defensive adverts from Gucci, from D&G. We saw this campaign at the top from the um, government in the top right hand corner in relation to the chicken box scandal. Um, and having knife crime stories written within, which, of course, um, didn't go down very well. 2020, of course, we saw the black squares. So the example on the left is um, L'Oreal, of course, their slogan being you're worth it. Um, and uh, this was from June 2020. They changed it to speaking out is worth it. And of course, the whole purpose of the black squares was to not relate this to as what um, Patricia Banks speaking about as being kind of um, racializing um, kind of political messages and commercializing them. Um, but just having the black square and just being silent for the day. Um, and they received lots of backlash from previous employees who said, actually, this happened to me two years ago. You did this to me. Um, don't pretend like you really care about what's going on. Um, and really importantly, I think one of the main papers that stand out for me in relation to um, what was happening last year with kind of anti-racism um, diversity talk was um, Sarah, Sarah Armour's paper from 2006. Sorry. And she actually speaks about the non-performativity of anti-racism agendas. She speaks about diversity talk as being non-performative and actually just speech ads. So we're just talking about all of these different things. We're getting all of these um, ethnic minority practitioners in. We're doing great by speaking about all of these things, but there's not going to be any changes necessarily um, in our actually in our, in our actual practice. Um, and looking at Christmas adverts and the backlash from Christmas adverts, we saw, and again, thinking about high expenditure in relation to advertisements across the year and Christmas being one of those times, um, we saw Tesco, which um, cut a black actress and actually cut quite a lot of their ethnic minority um, representatives and characters from their advertising series. Um, and this particular actress ex um, expressed her disappointed, disappointment in being um, cut. And Tesco came back and said, oh, well, it's it's, it's just how it is. That's how things are cut. Um, and of course, there was huge backlash. And then Sainsbury's were on the opposite hand, were criticised for being too diverse. So that's the ad right at the bottom, which I'm sure um, you all remember from over Christmas and the backlash from both of those. So you have one organisation which was supportive of what was going on and kind of really took on board. And Sainsbury's, they have quite, um, I've done lots of interviews with their practitioners and they are very diverse in terms of their advertising and creative team. And Tesco, it's definitely the opposite. Um, in terms of um, ethnic minority diversity amongst that creative sector. So you can see that there is a difference in terms of what happens when you do recruit ethnic minorities, but in terms of what positions they have, whether they're in more junior positions or creative directors, does make a huge impact. Um, and finally, in 2021, we've seen um, lots of organisations, not only in advertising, of course, different industries, the introduction of these anti-racism policies so turning internally, um, more diverse recruitment, but little changes. Um, so just to give you a contrast in terms of some of the difference between what some of the white practitioners um, in more senior positions and what some of the um, ethnic minority practitioners in more junior positions were saying. Um, we have the first quote, which is from Lisa, who is a white strategy director and leads lots of these workshops in professional advertising organisations. So she's one of these people in charge of setting precedents for good practice and says what we're seeing is more black and brown faces across our members. 
this is progress. This is where we need to be. And we're delighted. We've changed our policies and we know we have a better understanding of bias. Um, so within what Lisa does, she also puts on lots of training, unconscious bias training, anti-racism training. Um, and the second quote is from Vanessa, who's a black strategy advisor and also a member of the, the um, this same professional advertising association. But she works in a UK advertising organisation. So she says things were never going to change overnight. I'm just being real and the industry needs to be, too. Let's let's just say there's a lot of talk, a lot of training. But you tell me what changes have you seen in the past six months? And in that reference, she's talking about um, we go on to speak about changes in terms of um, senior management, ethnic minority representation and the actual changes in the advertisements that we're seeing um, across different television, social media platforms, etc. And um, so to summarise, we're seeing an increase in ethnic minority practitioners um, in advertising since 2020, um, but they're still in more junior and middle class, middle management positions. Sorry. The main increase is in diversity advocate position. So that says a lot in terms of what we are seeing, particularly on LinkedIn, on Twitter, when a brand or an organisation is posting a new member of staff or promotion. It's normally this person has been promoted to head of diversity or someone who's kind of um, you know, a diversity advisor, for instance. So it's less so in terms of the creative output side of things. There's also homogenization of diversity, and um, particularly through an increase of these roles. So, again, lots of what Sarah Ahmed speaks about, um, Pua speaks about, um, Lee Edwards speaks about as well, in terms of diversity is being seen as kind of this big bubble um, and things around racism, issues around racism, um, kind of microaggressions are being overlooked within organisations, but particularly professional advertising organisations. There's an increase in the unconscious bias and anti-racism training and wider, but we're yet to see lots of changes in working practice, lived experience and cultural production. And finally, there's an increase in non-performative speech acts, particularly in professional advertising organisations. And the facilitation of racial capital is still mostly at a junior level. So thank you for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Nessa, for your talk. Um, fantastic. Um, I am going to open it up to questions. I mean, just an observation, I, I guess, first. I mean, this is tracking reorganisations at the level of roles and positions within organisations. It's fascinating, as in horrifically fascinating, to see a phase that created titles such as head of diversity, but people in those titles in their own stages of, of disavowal and denial and obstruction for the kind of transformations that you're advocating and which some of the junior staff in encountering those spaces are advocating. So it, it's a fascinating story of a kind of reconfiguration uh, of, of professional work. But I was going to say two things to open it up. I think I'd really like to start by inviting questions that do justice to the paper and the research and focus on Nessa's talk and advertising. But just to flag up, um, many people who are listening to this talk are members of the policy network. And I think it's really interesting if we can move into the space of how policy analysts view this space and and open it up kind of genuinely as a seminar. For instance, you know, you led very much on economic capital, on cultural capital, on this interesting problematic concept of black cultural capital, problematic because of its own kind of homogenizing tendencies in relation to so much else that you've said. But given that, I guess many people listening here think about policy capital think about the leverage to have influence on policy agendas at various levels, whether that's regulatory authorities or government even, and um, through to organisations and their governance, and uh, without missing out that middle layer of professional associations, the IPA and others. So I think a lot of people listening w will have interest in advertising, but a lot of people also will have interest as policy analysts. And, and maybe... If, if I could just 
ask you first. I mean, if, if you framed your research in some of the kind of underlying research questions, I, what, what are some of the kind of driving questions that you want to explore as you take this research forward? This is a moment of huge change and you're kind of mapping elements of that change. What are some of the kind of guiding research questions for you? Yeah, so I think um, kind of partly what I spoke about was within does more diversity. So I think it's that balance between where we're seeing lots more junior practitioners being employed and also part of these organisations, these professional organisations. Um, but actually, to what extent does having them in these positions have an actual impact in terms of whether it's changes in policy or whether it's changes in the actual final project that we're seeing with advertisements. Um, so I think that's definitely kind of the main question. And also, as we see them moving into these more senior level positions, is that going to change anything? So it's kind of looking at those different kind of levels in terms of um, seniority. And to what extent is it happening at the junior level? What impact is that happen? Is, is that happening at the senior level? As that example I used with Saeed, um, again anonymized from that from that agency, um, he is part of the problem. And I've I've kind of spoken to him several times and kind of addressed some of the issues of his discourse, and he doesn't see it as problematic just because he sees he's been in this industry for a long time. He knows what he's doing. Um, so actually, is that going to alleviate any changes if he is um at this if, if there are more at this senior level so what else needs to be done okay brilliant um so I, i'm going to take the risk and assume we're, we're we're mainly academics and researchers so i'd really like to open this up um i'm maria michalis uh, from the university of westminster and i'm also co-vice chair of the mexa policy network uh, thank you, Nessa. This was fascinating. Shocking findings. Um, I was wondering if you know how different, if at all, is the advertising industry, advertising sector, compared to the media sector, and in particular, the screen industry. Um, do you know, are is the advertising industry worse or more or less the same? And then I can come back um, and follow up what uh, Jonathan was saying. So if you can give me an idea, if you know, thank you. Yeah, so I haven't particularly done research within the screen industry, but kind of my wider research um, kind of related to the early work on the PhD where I looked at the culture and creative industries in general, um, where I kind of looked at the role of PR, looked at um, the role of this kind of wider media industry, the role of digital, um, and as part of that looked at screen, they are facing similar issues. Um, and it does come down to the types of outputs that you're, you're putting out there. So for instance, my main comparison is between advertising and PR. Um, so if you're looking at PR from a content point of view, a content production point of view, it can lots of times be um, reactive in terms of if, as we saw last year with kind of the black squares, what they were doing was reactive. Um, but there are similarities, I guess, in what you're speaking about there in terms of the screen and advertising is that culture production is a lot more of a slower process in terms of you can be working on an advertising campaign or um, a television program, for instance, for a matter of months. So there's a lot more of a systematic process. There are a lot more people involved within that process. Um, so, no, I think it would be kind of interesting to do a comparison to see what the differences um, would be within that space. Right. Well, Maria, you cleverly queued up a follow up question. So <laughs> go for it. Thank you. Yes. So in terms of responses and what one can do, um, I mean, Basically, one has to fight fight this, you know, um, in in any spaces that we can. Um, so, if it, as you said, you know, it is an issue. It remains an issue in the advertising industry. Um, so, in policy terms, if we can influence uh, policy debate and policy action in this field. Mm -hmm. um, we have to do that. So we have to try and do that. 
so specific to the advertising sector, but also it's a much broader issue in the media and cultural industries. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's about the societies we live in. Yes, so it's not something that's specific to a sector, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the society we live in. So I think the more alliances uh, and um, we can uh, cultivate with like-minded groups, associations, activists, wherever we find them, because it's, you know, it's a broader issue. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to fight it at the sectoral level, but also at a much broader level to see some change. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I, I think that's it's kind of one of those things when we're speaking about we're seeing less in terms of advertising agencies, PR agencies, television production companies. It's all coming. To, we're kind of all coming together in terms of either creative agencies or media agencies. Um, and I think that is partly because we are facing we're not only reproducing lots of the same things and kind of similar things. So we need to work on the same teams, but we're also facing the same issues such as this so what would be let's say the difference of an anti-racism policy in an advertising agency or kind of in the screen industry um so I, I definitely think it is about kind of forming these alliances as well i definitely agree in that sense but and you see lots of work from kind of the creative diversity network and um kind of independent organizations such as um that's from the event the other day we kind of had lots of black creatives coming out um and kind of speaking about their organizations and how, what the work that they're doing so it's definitely about coming together but it's kind of like when we come together what what do we talk about how, how is this addressed um and of course this isn't going to be a quick process it's kind of looking at what does policy need what what would a good policy look like um, how do we get rid of the bad eggs? And I think it is one of those things about kind of um, kind of a bit kind of a bit grassroots ish and kind of coming together and as you said, kind of really challenging um, lots of what is being said at the moment, which is quite damaging. But also lots of these professional organisations coming out and admitting when they need help, um, such as the event that the ASA just ran um, and. Hopefully, with that consultancy, they'll take on a lot of the help that they definitely need as it's not an area of expertise. Great. Thank you. Can I ask a follow up? But I'll just mention to people, uh, Phil has very helpfully put in the chat um, the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, which I think does quite an illustrative, quite exemplary um state of the profession report each year but it's also deeply embarrassing for them because on ethnic diversity the percentage has flatlined for about the last five or six years i mean it stayed at round, round about nine percent and um, the ipa produced a survey in 2020 which likewise showed a kind of flattening uh, 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 Non-white people in the creative agencies were not moving up to senior positions. And although there was slight increase in very junior ranks, I mean, again, flatlining. And I just wanted to ask you, Nessa, it's a kind of provocative question in some ways, but I guess I've been very schooled in work by Ros Gill and others, which highlights egalitarianism as a deep pervasive myth in creative industry sector. In other words, it's an obstruction and it's reflected to some degree in the kind of complacency of your white leaders talking about meritocracy. I just wonder whether there's a case that egalitarianism has been to a degree a positive force in in promoting and enabling this wave of response to um, ethnic diversity, that, it, that it's it's actually the 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 myths dangerous and obstructive as they are have also to a degree be, been um a force that's helped propel the need to act and and the promotion of what ethnic diversity there is so i i suppose i just put it to you are there contradictions around meritocracy and egalitarianism that that particularly researchers might pick up and, and address so, sorry, Jonathan, do you mean in terms of um, how people are kind of seen as equal through the eyes of meritocracy and 
and how it's, it can be used as a positive force for diversity? I suppose I meant the self-image that you're coming to work in a sector which is diverse, genuinely open and progressive, um, has has created a space in which delivering on that is is promoted and to a degree easier. So even though the gap between myth and reality is still so great, the fact that the self-image of the sector is that it is progressive, that it is um you know, ethnically diverse has been a, a helpful element in the changes over the last few years. Um, I mean, partly, I mean, it's 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 a difficult argument to put forward, as, as Maria was saying as well. I guess it depends on your own experience and maybe the industry. Maybe that's why we do need to come together, um, because sometimes you speak to these practitioners and a lot of them have been employed just because that they don't have any experience and then they go in and they are used as the diversity advocate within these spaces um, and in other instances they've been recruited they feel that they've been fairly recruited um, and they've seen kind of um, white people within the interviews they've seen other kind of ethnic minorities within the interviews and they feel that they've been recruited fairly um, and potentially a lot of these initiatives coming forward with quotas and agendas has helped them get in um, and they feel that they're making a change. So I think it completely depends. But again, as kind of Maria was just saying, I think it's part of the wider agenda of what we're seeing. And if we're looking at what happened, I mean, this time last year, um, I'm just looking at the date. Of course, George Floyd's um, unfortunate event did, hadn't happened yet. And if we're looking at what happened exactly this time last year, lots of organisations hadn't even thought about um anti-racism policies or realised that they were racist and that these things were going on inside their organisation. So I guess in some ways it can be seen as a positive, but from interview responses, there are kind of loads of practitioners who feel that they aren't given fair opportunities. They are recruited within these positions to meet quotas. And then once they're in those positions, um, they're kind of static within those positions. They don't have a role um, or a voice to make creative decisions or move into um, kind of more senior positions. So I don't think we can downplay lived experience is kind of my response to that. Brilliant. Um, well, I want to invite some more questions, but can I ask a broader one and, and link to the discussion we've just had? Um, Policy makers are in this space, the regulators, the trade bodies. What specific contribution can academic researchers such as yourself, and you may self-describe as a critical researcher but or an academic researcher, what can you make in, a difference in this space? And how do you think your, your analysis and contribution is being um, recognised and responded to? What are, the, what, what are the challenges for academic researchers to uh, insert themselves into these debates in this space effectively? Mm. I, I think... Um... <laughs> I think one of the traditional problems that sometimes we face is sometimes academic research isn't taken seriously in industry. Um, when you look at kind of chairs and memberships of particularly the professional organisations, they are actually the practitioners who are working in the spaces um, and maybe haven't kind of taken the critical eye of doing um, a lot more of the kind of social, um, quantitative and qualitative research. Um, but also in a positive way, um, I think policy is changing. I think we are having a positive impact. So, for example, um, lots of the consultations that are kind of coming forward or have come forward in the past year, they are asking for kind of literature, um, literature reviews, kind of more academic um, sources and kind of more about research methodologies and kind of getting this quantifiable data. Um, so I think they are realising that um, there is a wider sector industry um, a, a more wider sector problem that is taking place and they don't have all of the answers from what they're doing within their organisation. So I think there's a lot of outsourcing that's happened. So um, academics can come in with that data and kind of that more subjective view of kind of examining the industry as a whole, but also the culture and creative industries. OK, brilliant. Well, I don't see questions, but um, let, me, let me ask another linked one and just kind of widen this out in, in the last part of the seminar. So to you, Nessa, 
Uh, what do you think are some of the insights media researchers in general might take from your work? So thinking about policy scholars, but perhaps much more broadly, media industry scholars. What, what do you think are some of the kind of key insights of your work? And maybe to queue up one thing, it certainly seems very challenging to me listening to you to deal with temporality. Um, this is research looking at work in 2015, 17, when there was kind of growing awareness of unstereotyping and policies, then Joyce Floyd and an acceleration. There are real challenges um, to plot the different life stages, if you like, of, of awareness and engagement from these organisations. So what are some insights for researchers more broadly um, for others across the field? Yeah, so I would say there's definitely um, there's a relationship between how policy is kind of diversity policy is being addressed kind of wider across the field. So it's not I think people are realising um, policymakers and kind of senior management that just having kind of blanket diversity statements is no longer um, effective and kind of no longer accepted. Um, but I think there are attempts. I mean, of course, the, the if, if you're going to kind of look at the actual um, work that's been put into these attempts, I think that's questionable. Um, so I think that's one area. Um, also, that it's not only about the policy. So there needs to be a relationship between policy, um, lived experience and cultural production. So I think a lot of the work needs to start looking at, OK, the, we've got these anti-racism agendas. We're all speaking about diversity, anti-racism. But what actual output are we seeing in terms of media outputs, whether it's an advertisement, whether it's a television show, whether it's content? Um, that's when you'll see those differences between what is um what is um, kind of these speech acts, which Sarah Armin speaks about. Um, and also, I think there needs to be a greater relationship between um, some more interdisciplinary work. Um, I think one of the one of the kind of frustrations at the moment that well, that I've kind of always had is that um, kind of media and sociological studies are quite detached from kind of marketing um, marketing studies. So kind of looking at um, social sciences, looking at media and kind of looking at business schools, we're kind of effectively trying to get the same answers, but we're going about it in different ways. So I think there needs to be lots more interdisciplinary work in that sense. Brilliant. Hi, Nessa. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to say I enjoyed it because who enjoys this? Mm. But <laughs> it is what it is. So just wanted to make a link with what pro probably what you just said and what Maria said. Um, I think going forward, it is actually very productive to do something that looks more at the intersections of the different professions that are covered by MEXA, mm -hmm. because some things are the same, but some things are different. That doesn't make one better than the other, though, if you are a minority, ironically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Maria, you were talking about potentially what might be um, better in advertising, perhaps, or worse. One of the things that possibly works in um, advertising a little bit better for people who are minorities is that it is a much more corporatized profession and it's it's heavily shaped by what clients want. So that can be both a good and a bad. But it does mean that once you've been in the industry for a few years in a particular kind of organization, say a medium or large enough agency, et cetera, if you are experiencing difficulties, there are more lateral options for you than somebody who maybe is, is they're born to be a journalist and they can't actually see any other way out. And there's so few options now to make a living as a working journalist. So specifically, you might be able to move from agencies where where I think we know anecdotally, I'm not sure what your research says, Nessa, but certainly anecdotally, I think a lot of minorities would say that their experience in agencies is worse. But then if they move laterally in-house, they have a better experience because certain sorts of companies, especially if they're global um, very large, if they're quoted on the stock exchange, have to tick particular boxes, have to be to be seen to behave. So many people report that they have a better experience. And in fact, that was what I was advised to do when I was a practitioner. And absolutely, my life changed forever, having left agencies to go in-house. So I think that's one difference. Um, 
at the same time, the definition of what you actually do for a living in journalism, while while all of the professions that we cover in Mexico are changing rapidly because of digital technologies, I find it's a, a lot worse for the people who are working in areas like advertising or PR, because they at no point got to dictate what their skill sets are. It's the client who does that. So the professional bodies that exist, this is part of the reason that they are so they are such weak representations of what's actually out there in the landscape. They possibly re represent maybe a percent or a couple of percentages of the people who actually con consider themselves to be in advertising or in PR or in marketing. Whereas if you're a working journalist, there's much more um, appeal to joining the union, for example. There's much more benefit to it, much more collegiality. So, so those are areas that I think are much, are very worthwhile looking at um, in greater granularity to understand how that then impacts the experience of people who feel marginalized. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say is that it's also really high time we started overlapping with a lot of the research that is being done on a young white woman in the creative and communication industries. The way that they are, their passion and their their creativity and their verve and their youth and their enthusiasm are all inculcated into the job and they're used up and paid all little or nothing to do it until they burn out and then they're kicked out. So what are the implications when you then overlap that with people who are marginalized for other reasons other than being young or white or perhaps working class, et cetera? Because I think that's quite important to learn what's then happening to other groups of people. And then finally, I wanted to say on methodologies, um, because Nessa, you will know, one of the biggest problems that all the creative and communication industries have in the UK right now is survey fatigue, because people who identify as black or brown are just fed up to the back teeth of being surveyed. But there are other ways and perhaps even more useful ways to to learn things that can be useful for a policy maker, for a regulator, for a professional body. And one of those things, I think, is um, to do more user experience research where we're alongside people trying to understand, for example, what is the day to day felt experience of the black journalist or media worker or person in advertising or PR. Um, but also in, in PR, there's some interesting research going on in the UK right now, tr uh, talking to people who have left the profession, because I think that group of people falls, continues to fall away. There's lots of surveys that have been done in the UK over the past uh, 15 to 20 years. But because people keep leaving, we have no understanding of what the experience is after people leave and where they move laterally. So in the research that Leon Edwards and I started last year, which we're still um, trying to, to dissect now, um, one interesting thing we're finding is that, is that people who count themselves as successful black or brown uh, communication workers get to middle management and somehow manage to forge a very unique kind of niche for themselves. They may no longer even identify themselves as whatever profession or occupation it is. And in that, they find happiness. And that's kind of everybody knows that as career advice. If you can find your niche, then then you feel you have a purpose. You can get up in the morning. But it's what kind of niche and, and niches by definition aren't aren't just knocking around the place. So I think um, talking to people who have left, who have opted out or who have been forced out, I think is going to become increasingly important if we want to understand how we can help uh, provide support systems, etc. But I think was was it you, Nessa, um, or perhaps Maria, was talking about the importance of going all the way back to things like education systems, social systems, etc. That that I think hasn't been incorporated enough into some of the research that's happened already. And that was it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, I'm going to invite Phil, but just to comment uh, on what Claire said. Um, my sense is that academic research around marketing professionals had a kind of big wave in the 90s, Sean Nixon's work and so on, um, but is is somewhat blocked and highly marginal. When I think of what you've just said, there are quite a lot of studies that have looked at journalists moving into PR, into political comms. There's a body of work which is not there 
in tracking the fluidity and hybridity across marketing communications people. Um, I think everything you said is very valuable uh, and, and welcome. Um, but there's a big gap. Yeah, sure. No, thank you so much for that, Cleo. I think um, you said some really valuable um, points there. Some of the things which I think um, we agree on and also what myself and Maria were saying earlier about things being more interdisciplinary. Um, and again, it's not it's not only about creative industries. It is about um education it's about um kind of mobility um about kind of family structure and things like that um and that all kind of needs to come into part of that conversation and that's all part of wider um studies as you said but i I think when i've been working on this project and the more i've got into it the more i've been looking at the relationship between policy the relationship between the gig economy agencies and these professional organizations and actually what's missing in terms of the findings um, is what you've just said and kind of something that I've not thought about is actually exiting the profession and understanding why people have exited. Um, because a lot of when you're when I'm speaking to a lot of these practitioners, they're saying they don't have the role models. They don't know how to mobilize. They don't have the social contacts within the organization or within the industry um, to, be, to be able to mobilize. They know people who have kind of gone out and started their own organization, whether that's kind of within advertising or kind of in kind of another consultancy role. But it's kind of that miscommunication and that lack of mentorship as well um, from other kind of black and minority ethnics. Um, So, no, I I definitely really appreciate what you're saying. I'd kind of love to um, at a later date hear a bit more about um, where you got. I remember when the link went out to in relation to your study with Lee last year. So be really interested if you've got any work coming out or if there's been any progress with that. So I think that's really important work to figure out why people are leaving. And is it because they've they've got to a certain level, they've hated it and, or is it just because they, whatever the reason is, there's just not enough data or research that's been published about it. So perhaps we could try as an outcome, and I'm looking to my colleagues as officers to kind of help share some of the research resources that's been touched on today um, to to benefit those who are listening and and wider researchers. Um, Thank you very much. Phil, your questions. Uh, Thanks, Nessa. Uh, Phil Ramsey, Ulster University. I'm chair of the Mexico Policy Network. Um, so I've got two questions. One is on your uh, interviews and the other is on the ASA. Um, so on interviews, I'm wondering what sort of level of resistance are you facing in trying to get access to interviews on the subject, uh, especially among senior figures in agencies? Uh, or is it the case that they do, they will speak to you, but then they just feed you this sort of corporate line? Um, so that's the first one. The second one then is on um, the ASA. And uh, my question is, is a failure in some areas of advertising regulation ultimately about the failure of the model of self-regulation? Um, I note that the ASA states in their website the self-regulation system works because it is powered and driven by a sense of corporate social responsibility amongst the advertising industry. So the question then is, is this ultimately about the failure of the model of self-regulation because CSR is not working in the way corporations tell us that it does? No, thank you, Phil. Um, <laughs> two really important um questions there actually and particularly the second one so in in terms of um your first question was in relation to kind of access and interviews i think people are willing to speak as long as they're anonymized and um kind of you're not speaking directly about the actual campaigns they're working on um as clear was saying i think surveys are kind of i i remember i, I remember kind of 30th of May last year, the amount of surveys I suddenly got in my mailbox and kind of from, from the, from the months after it. And it's kind of slowly dribbling out again. But as we're coming up to the anniversary again, the one year anniversary, they're kind of creeping back up. Um, but I think when you're actually sitting down and talking to people and people do want to speak about their lived experience, um, they are willing to kind of talk about it. And particularly if they think it's going to have an impact in terms of the outputs that you're putting out there. Um, they do ask, what's this research going to be used for? Um, and as long as they realise, some, some people don't want to talk, not everyone wants to talk, but those who have had particularly bad experiences, 
um, do want to have that conversation. So, and again, you do see that correlation between what the data is saying about kind of the drop in people entering the profession um, and asking them the reasons why. Um, it, those are some, it, it is because of those experiences that they've previously had within the industry. Um, and again, it's one of the things, of course, as kind of a, a black woman um, researching in the industry is being aware of reflexes, reflexivity um, as well. Lots of people, um, lots of my participants would say, if you were a white man, I wouldn't want to speak to you, but because you're a black woman, I think we'll share that experience and I want to open out to you. Um, so that's also something to also be considerable, uh, considerate of as a researcher. Um, and yeah, it's something that I've kind of spoken about, kind of in earlier work is about the problem of self-regulation in the advertising industry. Um, but then again, it's kind of what's what's the alternative model? We don't necessarily want the government to tell us what good practice is and who, who's who's then going to kind of lead and manage. And it is, I think, it's more about um, being conscious of who we're putting in these positions. And again, it's kind of that that problem of um, kind of social capital. In, in that sense, because someone like Saeed, who was one of the participants, who's the head of this agency, wherever he goes, he'll say, I've been in this industry for 20 years. I should be on this board. I should be the head. Um, and of course, lots of what he's saying is quite problematic and damaging. So, of course, people like him shouldn't be kind of the role model of what diversity stands for in the industry. But um, it, it's a difficult one. They they need to self-regulate, but it's who's doing who who is part of that membership group because a lot of it is these a lot of them are these kind of senior white men who are even leading in lots of these diversity positions as well um just because there's no one else to do it so um yeah it's kind of like that rolling <laughs> i can see clear kind of like a, a greener it's kind of like a rolling issue there um, there's kind of like no no perfect solution so no, they have a plan they know why they're doing it now yeah, so they, they know, of course they know why they're doing it but it's kind of like what what is the what it, is the it solution? usually leads up to them retiring from their head of agency position and looking for lots of um non-executive board roles where they can say look how CSR I am because of all of these talks I did in schools and I'm completely cynical when I get contacted by these white head of agencies now to come and talk to students. They are ticking boxes and once they've retired you never see them again. Yeah yeah there's kind of Oh, I can, there's one particular person who's kind of head of one of these organisations that, and that is kind of one of the main things he says. He openly admits it's one of the things he wants to put on his CV before he retires. Um, and kind of under him, he's got his son who's kind of taking over his head. So it's kind of looking at that reproduction and again, I think the problem more so is who, who is self-regulating. So. Yeah. <laughs> There was a, a another person I can think of who was ahead of a really, really big advertising agency in the UK. And she was sort of, you know, every every black agency's white friend for a while. Yeah. But she was just priming her CV so that she could get uh, a job in the US. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to stay in the agency, but move upward, which meant being based in the US. So. Yeah, yeah, that that's also kind of one. Of, that was one of the main components of my PhD. Actually, it kind of looked at um, kind of the comparison between UK and US and kind of agencies who have flagship um, bases across London, Los Angeles, and New York, and actually how there's this kind of circulation of practitioners at senior level, and that's why you're getting the same kind of communications. Exactly the same, particularly last year as well, you're getting the same types of outputs because it's the same people in senior management just kind of moving across different parts of the world. That that would be an important area perhaps to compare with media as well is yeah. to is to track circulation around a particular uh, commercial sphere. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much Nessa. Thank you for that and uh, thanks for a great talk. Thank you so much Phil. Thank you for the questions as well. It's really beneficial to can have a bit more thinking around different topics to think about. But to make two comments, I think one big link with a big agenda for a number of us is around governance. That that your research, Nessa, 
is articulating linkages from formal regulation through to rulemaking practices in a number of different spaces. So I think that's really exciting and really important. And I guess the bigger challenge for us all, which we've been discussing, is how we examine the influences on that governance, both within institutional and professional structures and outside. What sets of outside forces have pushed and shaped the governance responses occurring within professional advertising organisations? Um, and mapping that dynamism is is a challenge right across media and communications, but but very exciting. Um, great. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you to Nessa for a really insightful and wonderful talk at such a timely moment to discuss this topic. Thank you all so much for for coming.